God, we do thank you today that we can come into your presence and truly know that we are approaching a faithful God. Everything in life points to the fact that you are faithful. And today we, we may have some struggles, but in our struggles, I pray that you'll teach us straight from your holy word today that we definitely have a God who is faithful. Thank you that we can put our trust in you and know that we're in good hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I want to remind us that God's Word is a constant book of encouragement. And we do have a very encouraging message from God's Word today. Uh, we're being constantly reminded in our world, though, that these days that we are part of are unique days. Um, whether uh, enemies that we're facing are physical and visible, or whether they're invisible, uh, enemies are real, and we are facing some real enemies today. Uh, the mayor of a city about 60 miles from here shared this week that his area has not reached the peak of deaths from our invisible enemy, COVID-19. Uh, he is, uh, he's very concerned about his, his citizens, about the people who live with, with in his city. Um, are, you, are you aware that some people are offended when they hear the truth? Um, a number of years ago, uh, a lady was in a church where I pastored, and every Monday she would come and she would water the plants in the lobby of our church. And I noticed one day that the, the carpet around the plants in our lobby uh, was beginning to discolor. And I immediately recognized uh, the problem and diagnosed the problem. Uh, when the lady came the next Monday, uh, I thanked her in the best way I knew how for her service to the Lord through our church. And then I said to her, uh, are you aware that these are artificial plants? Now, the sad thing about that story is that she never spoke to me again. I mean, I would see her, it's about five years later, uh, I, I would see her at random places, and I could tell, you know how you can tell when somebody uh, walks away from you or walks away where, when they don't, want to, they don't want you to see them. And she never spoke to me again. Some people just don't want to hear the hard truth, the real truth. Um, United Nations reports that there are 195 countries in our world that are a part of the United Nations. Of the 195 countries in the world, 185 of those countries are battling this enemy called COVID-19. And I would suspect that the other 10 or countries that are so poor that they do not even have ways of testing for COVID-19. And so that's why uh, the, the world has declared that we are in a pandemic. Everybody in the world is facing this enemy. Uh, this sudden, unexpected crisis that we are all in can be a wake-up call for us. In Psalm 44, God's people... Uh, had been attacked, and they had been devastated. And this psalm is uh, another national lament in our psalms. I believe that we can pick up some very valuable pointers from this psalm. Uh, so look for them as I read Psalm 44 for us today. Psalm 44. The superscript says, For the choir director a mascal of the sons of Korah. Verse 1, God, we have heard with our ears, our ancestors have told us the work you accomplished in their days and days long ago. In order to plant them, you displaced the nations by your hand. In order to settle them, you brought disaster on the peoples. For they did not take the land by their sword. Their arm did not bring them victory. But by your right hand, your arm, 
in the light of your face because you were favorable toward them. You are my king, my God, who ordains victories for Jacob. Through you we drive back our foes. Through your name we trample our enemies. For I do not trust in my bow, and my sword does not bring me victory. But you give us victory over our foes and let those who hate us be disgraced. We boast in God all day long. We will praise your name forever. Selah. But you have rejected and humiliated us. You do not march out with our armies. You make us retreat from the foe, and those who hate us have taken plunder for themselves. Your hand, you hand us over to be eaten like sheep and scatter us among the nations. You tell your people, Sell your people for nothing. You make no profit from selling them. You make us an object of reproach to our neighbors, a source of mockery, a ridicule to those around us. You make us a joke among the nations, a laughingstock among the peoples. My disgrace is ever before me all day long, and shame has covered my face because of the taunts of the scorner and reviler, because of the enemy and avenger. All this has happened to us, but you have not forgotten. We have not forgotten you or betrayed your covenant. Our hearts have not turned back. Our steps have not strayed from your path, but you have crushed us in a haunt of jackals and have covered us with deepest darkness. If we had forgotten the name of our God and spread out our hands to to a foreign God, wouldn't God have found this out? since he knows the secrets of the heart. Because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Wake up, Lord. Why are you sleeping? Get up. Don't reject us forever. Why do you hide and forget our affliction and oppression? For we have sank down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up, help us, redeem us because of your faithful love. And now may God add his blessings to the reading of his word. The cry for redemption is urgent for the psalmist in this psalm. Can can you see where we need that urgency as well today? Let's consider two things about this cry for redemption. First of all, the cry for redemption demands honest assessment. In verses 1 through 8, the psalmist assesses the past. He gives testimony to the faithfulness of God working in the lives of his people. Verse 1 says, We have heard with our ears, our ancestors have told us the work you accomplished in their days, in days long ago. When he's talking about days long ago, he's describing how faithful God had been in leading his chosen people out of bondage in Egypt and leading them through the wilderness under the leadership of Moses to the promised land. In verse 2 then, the, the psalmist describes how God restored his people to the promised land. Verse 2 says, in order to plant them, you displace the nations by your hand. In order to settle them, you brought disaster on the peoples. And so the psalmist is giving credit to God for taking the lead in opening the door for his chosen people to enter back into the land that God had promised Abraham many, many, many years ago. And the reference is to God using Joshua to conquer the Holy Land. In verse 3, the psalmist affirms that Uh, affirms that God loved his people and he gave them identity. He gave them victory. Verse 3 says, For they did not take the land by their sword. Their arm did not bring them victory. But your right hand, your arm, in the light of your face, because you were favorable toward them. See, assessment can be something that is really healthy. And really good. I have great memories of playing college football. And I played before the days of modern technology, obviously. 
Uh, today, most major colleges uh, constantly monitor the health of their players. They have these practice helmets that they put on that monitors weight changes and monitors vital symptom changes electronically. So if, if somebody is not healthy or if somebody is not uh, eating the right things or exercising in the right amount, these electronic devices point that out in the life of the athlete. We had this giant chart posted by the exit door going out to our workout facilities and our practice facility. And every day when we went out of the locker room, before we stepped out of the door to go onto the practice field, we had to chart the weight as we stepped up on this giant scale. We stepped up on it and we had to weigh ourselves and we then had to write our weight on that giant chart. And then... When we would finish practice, we would go in, take a shower, and, and put our clothes on, start back out the door. And as we started back out the door, we had to step back up on that scale, and we had to weigh out. And so that weight scale and charting those weight scales became an assessment tool, the only one and the best one that we had in the day that I played, where we could monitor uh, our health and assess our health as well. Uh, Based on the assessment of the past, in verses 4 through 8, the psalmist turns to giving honest praise to God. He's already assessed that God was great, but then look at verse 4. He turns to actually praising God. He says, you are my king, my God, who ordains victories for Jacob. So based on his honest assessment, he gives his heartfelt praise to God. Verse 5, he says, through you we drive back our foes, through your name we trample our enemies. You see where the credit is going for the good things that have happened in the past as he assesses the past from his life. He gives credit and he gives praise to God. Then in verses 6 and 7, uh, he assesses the fact that the Israelites fought Literally, they went out to war led by Joshua. They fought the battles, but God is the one who destroyed their enemies and gave them the victory. Verse 6 says, For I do not trust in my bow, and my sword does not bring me victory, but you gave us victory over our foes, and let those who hate us be dis disgraced. So he assessed the fact that this generation of Israelites were continuing to achieve victory with God's power. And then in verse 8, he says, We boast in God all day long. We will praise your name forever, Selah. So he takes a breath, he takes a pause at this particular point in this musical rendition which is what this psalm is, of giving praise to God. Assessing every victory won in the past gave him reason to praise God. Now we know that the psalmist was hurting. He was very discouraged, as you will see as we continue to unpack this psalm. He was struggling with defeat. He was struggling with discouragement. But in his heart, he was able to assess the blessings that God had given and brought into his life from his heritage up to this point in his life. Let me ask you, when, when was the last time you assessed your life? Especially in relationship to the, to the way God has given blessings to you in your life up to this point. One, one month from now, my wife Gail and I will celebrate our 45th wedding anniversary. Five or six weeks ago, she was furloughed from her professional work. She hasn't been able to go to work a single day in five or six weeks. Now, I've been able to continue to work almost every day, and we've recently spent more time together at home than I can ever remember. We love each other more today than we ever have in our life. You know why? 
it's not because of what we do for each other. In fact, there are things that I do that I'm sure drive my wife crazy. I mean, if she's really honest and she tells you uh, how she really feels sometimes about the way I act, I'm sure she would honestly tell you that I know sometimes I just, I just drive her crazy. But our love for each other is not dependent on what we do. Our love for each other is dependent on who we are. We made a commitment to God and to each other 45 years ago that we would be faithful and we would be true to each other. And it's what we know about believing in each other that draws us closer together today than we've ever been before in our life. One of my favorite songs when I was growing up was a song entitled Count Your Blessings. Want me to sing it for you? <laughs> uh, that's a joke. Uh, I know you don't want me to sing it for you. But let me just give you the essence of that song. When your life gets turned upside down, count your blessings from God. Not because of what He does, but because of who He is. Throughout today and this week, I, I challenge you to join me in counting your blessings through the lens of who God is. When you're tired and lonely, anxious or afraid, discouraged or burdened, count your blessings through the lens of who God is. When you're tempted, sad, angry, or weary, count your blessings through the lens of who God is. Never forget the greatest blessing in life is knowing who God is and knowing Him personally. When you know who He is and you know Him personally, it gives you a different lens to assess everything that's happening circumstantially around your life. Counting blessings through the lens of who God is transfers the focus of your life off of yourself onto God. And that's what we all need to do, especially during these days. That's what the psalmist was doing. He was discouraged. He was in despair. He was depressed. But he was looking to God for who God was rather than what God was doing at the current time. So how do you do that? How do you assess knowing God and walking with God and looking at life through the lens of who God is? Recently, I did a 360 assessment of my life. I invited eight or ten of my friends to do uh, fill out this survey based on what they knew about me and what they thought my uh, habits were and how I was affecting uh, the lives of other people from who I was. I did the assessment myself on my own self, and then I compared that assessment with the eight or ten that my friends did. It displayed not only what I thought about how I acted, but how other people who were close to me were looking at how I act and how I react more importantly, to situations around me. So when's the last time you did an honest assessment of your daily life? Now that can be painful. It can be an, a, a, an uneasy feeling to ask other people their impressions of what they think about you and then compare that to what you think about yourself. But the cry for redemption begins with honest assessment. And I will challenge you to dive into that this week or sometime very soon. The biggest question is, do I really know God? That may be the most important question you answer in all of your life. Do I really know God? Because the second thing is, the cry for redemption demands trust in God's sovereignty. You know Him as the psalmist did, and then you put your complete trust in God's sovereignty. Now, if you look at the words of the rest of this psalm, you notice a shift in the way the psalmist was approaching God and the way he was approaching life. He starts out by praising God, and that's a really good thing. 
But then he shifts from praise to asking questions. Have you ever wondered why life doesn't always go like you planned? I mean, we all do that. We all, we all fall into the trap of understanding, trying to understand life through our perspective. It's a normal thing to do. But the psalmist had to learn that there was a better way to process life. In verses 9 through 22 of Psalm 44, the psalmist opens up a, just a, an avenue of raw emotions, expresses these raw emotions about his relationship with God and about his understanding about what God was up to. He doesn't understand why it appears that God has abandoned his people. But in verse 9, he says, but you have rejected and humiliated us. You do not march out with our armies. You make us retreat from the foe. And those who hate us have taken plunder for themselves. You hand us over to be eaten like sheep and scatter us among the nations. You sell your people for nothing. You make no profit for selling them. So it appears that the psalmist has shifted. It appears that he's questioning and doubting God. He's feeling rejection from God. He's feeling humiliation like God doesn't really care about what his people are going through. His faith is being challenged. Now, now some of you may be there today. Some of you may be having these same feelings about your faith being challenged in the situation that you're facing personally. Being tortured by any enemy can produce doubt in what God is up to. But we have to remember the psalmist was doubting but he was not losing faith and trust in God. He was asking good questions, hard questions. But he was not forsaking his trust in God. Because trust in God is not circumstantial. It can't be. How you feel is how you feel. In verse 13, he goes on, he says... You make us an object of reproach to our neighbors, a source of mockery and ridicule to those around us. You make us a joke among the nations, a laughingstock among the peoples. My disgrace is before me all day long, and shame has covered my face because the taunts of the scorner and reviler, because of the enemy and the avenger. Often our enemies, just like with the psalmist, cause us shame and mockery, and we allow them to challenge how we express our faith in God. That's how the psalmist was feeling at this particular time in his life. But the psalmist teaches us that when we are struggling, we can turn to God in prayer. And that's what he does. God works for His glory in our greatest times of need. And often we miss that. If the focus is on us, often we miss what God might be up to in the struggles that we're having in life. But never hesitate to speak to God with an uncensored heart. Raw emotions were flowing from the psalmist. And I'll guarantee you today, God can take that. He continues in verse 17. All this has happened to us, but we have not forsaken you or forgotten you or be betrayed your covenant. Our hearts have not turned back. Our steps have not strayed from your path. But you have crushed us in a haunt of jackals and have covered us with deepest darkness. So in being distraught, the psalmist honestly felt like his people who had been loyal to God were being crushed and were being thrown to wild animals and being abandoned by God. The psalmist claimed that his people had been loyal and yet they couldn't find what God was up to 
in this traumatic time that they were facing. Even though he felt crushed, even though he felt like he had been abandoned, his faith was solid. Why do I say that? Well, I say that because he was still crying out to God. He was still holding on to that faith in God. In fact, his life was immersed in faith in God or he wouldn't have even been addressing God. He would have been turning his back on God and running away from God. But he didn't do that. He was expressing his feelings to God, honest, raw feelings to God, honest emotions to God through praying to the Almighty God. And that's what you and I need to do today. Notice that his faith was solid. He was asking questions. Asking questions is very different from running away from your faith in God and losing your faith in God. We can be unwavering and at the same time be confident in our faith in God even when we don't understand what God is up to. In fact, most often, most often, we don't see the big picture. We're not aware of what God is up to in the big picture. But an unwavering faith in God says, I'm going to put my trust in God no matter what my circumstances are. The psalmist was feeling inwardly and outwardly that he was blameless before God. And yet God was continuing to crush him. And so in verse 20, he asked, if we, had, if we had forgotten the name of our God and spread out our hands to a foreign God, wouldn't God have found this out since he knows the secrets of our heart? See, there was a, there was a genuine understanding of the vast knowledge of God working in history. But in verse 22, he says, because of you... We are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Wake up, Lord. Why are you sleeping? Get up. Don't reject us forever. So I think you would agree with me that it's natural to question God when people we love are suffering, when people we love are hurting, when people we love are puzzled and discouraged. The psalmist was asking great questions, but he was not questioning his faith in God. You have to remember that. That's a great principle for any time you're going through a struggle, a trial in life. One day the disciples were walking along with Jesus and Jesus was teaching them. And they looked out and they saw a blind man. In John chapter 9 and verse 2, we have this story recorded. And Jesus, the Bible says, His disciples asked Him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's work might be displayed. So what was Jesus saying to his disciples? The same thing he's saying to you and me today. You have to trust the sovereignty of God. That means that God doesn't make mistakes. That means that God sees the big picture. And some things that happen to us and to others we love on this earth can't be humanly explained. They can't be explained through human logic. They're done for the glory of God. So this is a picture then of how Jesus actually was treated by God Himself, His heavenly Father. The only Son of God, the person of God who came to this earth and lived as a man, the Messiah, was treated just like the psalmist is describing in Psalm 44. Verse 22, he says, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. This is a picture of how God treated Jesus, His Son, the Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7, the prophet paints this picture. He says, 
like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before his shearers, he did not open his mouth. We know this is talking about Jesus. The psalmist was not even aware of what God was up to when, when, when God was setting them up to be a picture of how God works in the lives of human beings. Jesus, God's sinless Son, sacrificed His life on the cross for you and me. For every human being that's ever been born. The cross that Jesus hung there and died on teaches us that pain has a voice, but pain does not have the final answer. Jesus died on the cross so that He could have the final word over death and over sin. Romans chapter 8 and verse 36 reminds us that believers should expect suffering when we live our life as a believer in Jesus. Just like Jesus experienced suffering, we do as well. Psalm, uh, Romans 8, 36 says, Because of you, talking about God, because of you we are put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. How's that for heretical prosperity gospel that's so prevalent throughout our world today? I think if, if, if one thing COVID-19 has done for us, it's helped us realize that most areas of life that really count, we are powerless. We are out of control. And God controls the things that are really important in life. In Desiring God, an, an article in Desiring God, John Piper cites another article from Mission Frontiers magazine. And I want to share just a little brief part of that article with you today. In 1983, the Sudan was declared an Islamic Republic. Sharia law was imposed on all the country's citizens. Since that time, thousands of believers in Jesus Christ have been slaughtered simply for their faith in Jesus. Now, Piper closed the article, and here's why I'm referencing it today. I want to give you a quote. Quote, the effect of this story has had, the effect this story has had on me is to make me want to die for Christ. And while I live, to live as radically as I can. It makes me wake up in the middle of the day screaming against the American dream of wealth and comfort and fashion and big retirement accounts and new cars and multiple houses and aimless nights in front of the TV. God never promised ease in this world. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. But if I say it, I better live it. Please pray for me. End of quote. See, God may seem to be asleep, but He's not. But God will not be rushed. And God will not divert from His plan to bring salvation to the people of the world like you and me. He knows what He's doing. And that's why it's imperative and compelling for us to trust in Him. That's why I say there is great encouragement in this psalm from the heart of the psalmist. The psalmist is so much like you and me. And we need to understand that God has a plan, and it's a plan of unfailing love, merciful love for those who would follow Him and know Him and call on Him. So the cry for redemption produces trust and praise. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 
That's exactly what the psalmist has expressed in verse 8. Remember in verse 8, he says, We boast in God all day long. We will praise your name forever. There's the faith. It's in spite of these circumstances that we now know about that was going on in the psalmist's life. He still placed his faith and trust in sovereign God. And that's why he says in verse 24, Why do you hide and forget our affliction and oppression? For we have sunk down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up. Help us. Redeem us because of your faithful love. Do you see it? The redeemed call on God when we are afflicted, when we are oppressed, when we are discouraged. The appeal that the psalmist was making is the same appeal that you and I can make today. And that is, make the appeal to God and make the appeal for the honor of God. The glory of the sovereign, unfailing God. The same God that the psalmist was putting his trust in is the same God today that you and I are called to put our faith and put our trust in. You can't receive and understand the love of God without trusting and praising Him regardless of the circumstances that are going on around us. And that's why I say that the redeemed put our faith and trust in our sovereign God. So hope for the future of our world today lies within trusting Almighty God. Regardless of our circumstances, the redeeming power of God is available to all who will call on Him today. And I appeal to you to find the encouragement that we can have in God by putting our total trust in His redeeming love for you and me today. The word redeemed is an interesting word. It means to be bought back. Why do we need to be bought back today? Well, the reason we need to be bought back is because we're sinners. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We're sinners. And our sin separates us from God. We were created to have a relationship with God. And when we sin, we separate ourselves from God. And so we need redemption because of our sin. And God has provided that for you and me today. All of life including suffering, is under God's loving care. This sudden, unexpected crisis that we're facing today can be a wake-up call. The psalmist, look at it, the, the psalmist was calling on God to wake up. But even as he was calling out to God for God to wake up, God was literally calling the psalmist to wake up. And that's the same for you and me today. God is calling us to wake up. Put our trust in Him. Put our total faith, the weight of our life, totally in His hands. Such a time as this can devastate people. Or it can cause people to seek God. I was in a conference call this week with a number of pastors in our county. And, and I simply asked the question, guys, what, what do you see going on around you today? Is what we're experiencing causing people to turn back to God? Oh, how my prayer would be that that would be the case. I hope I'm not seeing everything there is to see, but I don't see it. I don't see people turning back to God. And I pray and plead with people as I plead with God for Him to continue to be merciful toward us and call us back to Himself so that we can be redeemed and so we can put important things as the priority of our life. See, God doesn't want us social distancing from Him. He wants us drawing closer to Him than we've ever been before so He can wrap His arms around us 
and draw us to His love. If you're feeling the weight of this world today, put your trust in God's redeeming love. Draw close to Him because His mercy is abundant. He's calling you to Him today. That neighboring mayor that I mentioned in the beginning of my message this morning was urging everyone to keep our guard up. He was doing that because he genuinely cared about the people in, in his circle of, of influence. That's why I want us to ramp up in our lives the urgency of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. See, this coronavirus it, pandemic, it'll pass. Life will go on. But the crisis of sin is the most important crisis for us to be reminded of today. And the cure for that crisis is a sure cure. And that is God's redeeming love. So God is calling us to wake up and know His redeeming love and share His redeeming love. This morning, I want us to look back and I want us to assess that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit created this world for His pleasure. He created this world in a perfect way, but man sinned against God, turned our back on God, and because of our sin, we moved away from God. But God, through His redeeming love, has provided for us a way for us to be restored, to be redeemed. Jesus, God's Son, became one of us he was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. And then He sacrificed that life on the cross for your sin and for my sin. God wants to redeem us today through the blood of Jesus. And all we have to do is turn to Him and just cry out to Him and ask Him for forgiveness of our sin, repent of our sin, turn away from our sin and turn back to Him. He became one of us so we can become a true child of His. And I challenge you to accept that gift that God is offering you today. Accept the victory that He offers you over death that He won through the cross as He shed His blood, His redeeming blood for you. And then make sure as you put your faith and trust in Him that you keep your focus on Him and not your circumstances. In a moment, we're going to join together and sing about our living hope. And as we prepare to do that, I want to give you two simple application points to take with you today and through this coming week. First of all, I want to challenge us to praise God as we assess our past blessings. And remember, the greatest blessing that we've ever had or ever will have is our personal relationship with knowing God. Last week, we learned that as we studied Psalm 43, that it's always appropriate to pray, it's always appropriate to preach to ourselves, and it's always appropriate to praise God. So for the past six weeks, we have been with God in prayer and asking you to join us in prayer before each of these services. Today, I want you to assess that prayer life that you have. Are you resting in the awe of the presence of God? Are you? Are you confessing sins regularly and saying to God, I'm sorry, and showing Him that you're sorry by the way you allow Him to change the direction of your life? Are you constantly thanking Him for His available presence in your life? And are you depending on Him for help? Are you crying out to Him for help? See, those are the kind of things we pray about and those are the kinds of things we ought to be preaching to ourselves about. And when we do that, when we are praying without ceasing and preaching to ourselves about the truth of the Gospel of Christ, then and only then can we give praise to God and then and only then will we be constantly giving praise to God. So assess 
all these blessings today. And then finally, secondly, praise God by trusting His redemption through Jesus. You can never have a friend on this earth who can never be as close a friend as Jesus is to you. So bring Him into your life today. Walk with Him. Talk with Him. Let Him guide you today. Have you been redeemed? Acts 16.31 says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. My prayer for you today is that you will believe in Him and if you believe, when you believe in Him, you will celebrate Him through all the circumstances that might be circling in your life and around your life. God, I thank You today that You have loved us so much to bring us into this world and to offer us the ability to walk through this life with You. God, I know that for many people, life is tough right now. Some people are being crushed by isolation. Some people are being crushed by disease. Some people are being crushed by stress and problems that are occurring because of circumstances outside of our control. But thank you for reminding us today that no matter what's going on around us, we have a shelter. We have a redeeming shelter that we can put our faith and trust in. So even though we may be asking good questions, God, help us to never question how much you love us and the fact that you are sovereign. And I'm so glad for that today. Thank you that we can put our hope in you, our living hope. And thank you that we can celebrate that by singing together about that right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.